uh, uh, I welcome uh, Professor N.P. Gupta, uh, Dr. Amit Ghosh, Dr. Ravi Mohan, and Dr. Uh, Lakshman Prabhu, Dr. Amleshet. Um, and today we are going to have this Euro Oncology section webinar and uh, the important topic of hormone sensitive prostate cancer. Uh, today the, it will be moderated by Professor N.P. Gupta, uh, Padma Shri, Professor N.P. Gupta. He's teacher of teachers, and I'm happy that such a senior person is conducting the program today. So we have very interesting topics, and uh, I welcome you all for this very important webinar. Dr. Lakshman Prabhu, please. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Once again, <clears throat> I thank the Euro Oncology section for choosing a topic like this. This, I'm sure, will excite every urologist, not necessarily the specialist. Because this particular topic has got so many terminologies like androgen, sensitive, androgen, dependent, castrate, sensitive. And a student can be grilled on all this terminology. I'm sure with uh, Professor Gupta here, I think you know he'll steer this entire program in such a way that all of us will have a, a very good understanding of this topic of hormone-sensitive prostate cancer. That is what I am looking forward to in this. And uh, thanks again. Uh, thanks once again. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, let us, I think, uh, look forward to a, a great uh, webinar today evening. Thank you very much. Sanjay, you're muted. Ravi Mohan, you can start. So, uh, I'll invite Dr. Amit Ghosh to uh, say a few words. Welcome, everybody. Good evening. I think today evening will be quite thrilling, but I'm just going to digress for two minutes with all your permission. We have taken on this mantle of creating the Euro Oncology section of the USI. So this has become a huge responsibility on us. Um, negatively speaking, we've had very little time to actually uh, organize things because the demand was that we should finish the annual conference in in the month of by the month of july so we have actually scheduled ourselves on the 9th and 10th of june to be held at new delhi this was a change i hope everybody by now knows that initially it was programmed for rishikesh but for unavoidable reasons we are actually hosting it at new delhi and anup kumar is actually the organizing secretary now and it is they're being spearheaded by him the whole organization However, there are two little appeals that I want to make. We are making all these efforts and a humongous amount of effort uh, uh, every week and every day um, so that we can build up because, you know, there are a lot of expectations out of the euro-oncology section. Not that in any, any section is more important than the other. Somehow or other, this has, there is expectations are very high. So for this year, we have actually set up a theme that we will, uh, for every seminar, we will actually leave, uh, keep a bias on the advances in a genetic approach towards eurocancers. That is why this topic. Before I actually close my talk, I would like today the senior most person, we have got hold of his time. And uh, he's, I'm sure you will agree, he's more energetic than many of us, which is Professor N.P. Gupta. I have an appeal to you, sir. We are basically being short of time and being uh, uh, a lot of negativity around with a little bit of COVID around. We actually want to have a lot of um, uh, uh, attendance, a lot of response. May I appeal to you? May I appeal to you that you make an appeal on our behalf and you show us, you be the torchbearer for doing the registration for this conference. If you are the torchbearer, you have multitudes of followers. Our job becomes much easier. Maybe one or two lines of encouragement from you and direction from you will be helpful for the annual conference because we are now on countdown. Today is the 10th of April and our conference is 9th and 10th of June. So we've exactly got 59 days. So that is why every day, every hour counts. Everybody is busy in their job and we need role models like you who we bank on when we are in trouble. We are not yet in trouble, but I think there is no point in getting into trouble and getting out of it. 
Professor Gupta, my personal appeal to you. Thank you, Amit. Thank you, Amit. And uh, it will be uh, my pleasure to register yeah. myself first for this uh, sectional meeting uh, on 9th and 10th June. Uh, as a cl uh, clinical, I do general urology practice mostly, and what I have changed, I have seen that 40 to 50 percent of our work is oncology. And it is not uh, because of any referral region or something, but because of the awareness in general public increase in longevity of the life, the number of the patients of the cancer are increasing, and especially in uh, denied to urinary cancer. So I think so this is a very important topic. And uh, my full support will be with you and your team, whatsoever help you require, I'm ready to help to support in any way. And it is in Delhi, so no problem, it's my hometown and very close to my personal house also. There's a uh, airport is only 15 minutes. So any help is required, I'm always available. And I appeal to all the members of the Urology Society of India, please join for this sectional meeting. Thank you very much, Amit. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gupta. Thank you very much. That's, that, this will go a long way because this gives the credibility. Now, without wasting much time, may I now um, welcome Professor Amalesh Set to open the innings today. And he is going to give us a talk, rather difficult for us. So he, I, we are sure that in the next 20 minutes to 25 minutes, he is going to talk on genetics in the diagnosis and management of hormone-sensitive prostate cancer. So he's going to cover not the mundane stuff, but what we should know as the cutting-edge um, theorems in this month of April 2023. Over to you, Amlesh. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everybody. And uh, special thanks to Dr. Amit for uh, inviting me. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, but it's yes. not full screen. Okay, I'll go to full screen. Go to slideshow. Slideshow. Okay. So this role of genetics in metastatic prostate cancer I still remember when I was a resident, then also this used to be a theory question, role of genetics in cancer, role of genetics in urology, et cetera, et cetera. So all of us who have been trained in the last 30, 40 years have had this theory question. But uh, let me tell you from the realm of uh, theory, now it has come into the realm of practice. For the last about seven, eight years, there is so much of data that has come regarding the role of genetics in prostate cancer. And I'll very briefly discuss what we know. And there are lots of things which are evolving. And so whatever I say today will not stand tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll have a, definitely a lot more information and we'll have definitely new guidelines coming up tomorrow. Uh, we know that prostate cancer is the second most commonly diagnosed cancer in men, accounting for 15% of all cancers diagnosed in men. And we also know that in autopsy series, as the age keeps on increasing, more and more patients will be found to have prostate cancer. At the age of 80, approximately 80% 80 of the men would have prostate cancer on the uh, autopsy. So now uh, there is a long-term follow-up available from the Norwegian twin cancer study, where they followed up monozygotic and dizygotic twin brothers over decades and lifelong. And they found that they estimated statistically that 57% of prostate cancer risk can be attributed to genetic factors. So from that study, this is the uh, estimate based on some statistical model, which obviously may be some kind of an exaggeration looking at the study design of very highly selected people. Uh, then the prostate cancer database from Sweden has estimated that if, if uh, in uh, Prostate cancer for men with a brother with prostate cancer by the age of 65 is almost 15% compared with about 5% in men without a brother having prostate cancer. Which means at the age of 65, if the brother has prostate cancer, then you are about three times more likely to have prostate cancer. And at the age of 
75 this risk goes up even further so uh, there is a very strong family history and this is something which has been known for decades that if father has prostate cancer then the son should be careful if brother has prostate cancer then the brother should be careful so this genetic role has been known and suspected but the it is getting more and more defined now there is this study which was sponsored by stand up to cancer and the prostate cancer research foundation and the earliest data came up in 2015 where the results of first 150 biopsies from metastatic tissues was reported and they found that as high as 23% of the tissues had mutations which can have some kind of a therapeutic action uh, so uh, the load of mutations in the cancer tissue in prostate cancer tissue is very high and the other study has also shown that patients who have braca2 mutations they are reasonably suitable candidates for platinum based chemotherapy platinum based chemotherapy is kept as a reserve or as a last resort in patients uh, or is used very sparingly and most patients actually do not receive platinum based uh, chemotherapy but there is a study which shows that braca2 mutation has been correlated with response to uh, platinum based therapy it can be cis platinum based chemotherapy it can also be carbo platinum based chemotherapy it is not necessary that it has to be cis platinum and then there is this uh, two parp a study which is a phase 2 trial where it has been shown in a limited number of patients that if there are hrr gene mutations then these patients are likely to respond to parp2 inhibitors even in advanced metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer stage so uh, i have already talked about the germline testing and the somatic testing but i'll just uh, just for the sake of clarification of concepts i'll talk about what is germline testing and what is somatic testing germline testing means that whatever are the genes which are inheritable you know the genes that are present in the germs or you can say the sperms or whatever whatever the so these these uh, genes would be present in all the cells of the body these are the genes which have been inherited from your parents and therefore for germline testing the genes that need to be tested they can be tested either in the blood or in the saliva or from the buccal mucosal smear that can be taken then what happens is that over and above these uh, inherited genes or inherited gene mutations the prostate cancer cells with multiple uh, divisions and with multiple modifications because of the treatment because of hormonal treatment etc etc as the as the stage progresses as the patient progresses from hormone sensitive to hormone refractory phases there are the the genetic load keeps on increasing and this genetic mutation load is basically present in the either in the prostate cancer cells or at the sites of metastases and generally there is a high correlation between the metastases the genetic load of both the prostate and the metastatic site and therefore if you have to test the uh, mutations in the prostate cancer or in the metastases then you obviously have to analyze the tissue and check the mutations in the tissue so uh, uh, so there are multiple testing approaches the two you know uh, the profound trial has found a correlation between 15 genes and those 15 genes are the most commonly checked genes in india we have a number of labs doing these 15 genes and i also talk about what are the gene panels that are available abroad uh then there are you know this this is known as prostate cancer specific gene panel the 15 genes and then there is another gene panel which is called as the pan cancer gene panel so pan cancer gene panels that are used in different countries and by the different labs are different but one pan cancer gene panel that is used in india has 200 genes 
and now this lab has introduced this 200 gene panel and has kept the cost of analysis the same as that of 15 gene panels so therefore there is a, a tendency or you can say uh, one finds it kind of lucrative to get these 200 genes tested at the cost of 15 genes but the problem is that with so many genes being tested there are so many issues that come up so many uh, how to interpret those positive genes and then some of the abnormal genes that you may you may not actually uh, be able to use them practically so i have already said that somatic mutations are not heritable and are required during the process of cell division and here the sources of tumor dna for somatic testing include tumor resection specimens the radical prostatectomy specimen or the biopsy and the new method that is coming up is the circulating tumor dna in blood so there are these things are very expensive and the yield is very low but there are so many studies going on on circulating tumor dna and there are ways of finding out that these, this particular circulating uh, uh, dna is coming from prostate and not from any other area but these facilities are available only in sophisticated labs and the amount of DNA that is available is small and the interpretation is at the present time, I would say, mainly a research methodology. And the other thing that I have already talked about is that these somatic mutations can change. Initially, when the patient is hormone sensitive, the mutation load is less. And as the time progresses and as the patient progresses from hormone sensitive to castration resistant, the, the, the load of somatic mutation also goes up. And therefore, these somatic mutations, if they have to be checked and used for clinical application, then it has to be done as per the uh, status of the patient. So, uh, what are the germline variants associated with prostate cancer? So, as I told you that uh, the profound uh, study found these 15 ones. And of these, the ones that are most important are the BRCA1, BRCA2, ATM, Hox B13, and Check2. And these are the ones, these few names are, are, are the names that maybe as urologists also we should know because, uh, uh, and then we also know that BRCA, what is BRCA? BRCA is breast cancer related gene. And therefore, obviously, it was detected first in patients of breast cancer and in the families of breast cancer patients. And uh, therefore, and now we know that if there is a if there is a first degree relative with a female with breast cancer in the family, then the risk of prostate cancer in the same family in men of the same family is also increased. And here you can see the uh, the associations, the BRCA two associations are uh, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer, and melanoma cancer. And then there is a syndrome known as Lynch syndrome, where there is microsatellite instability, and these patients in, in these families, they are prone to multiple cancers. Either they can have multiple cancers or a wide variety of cancers. And in patients where there are multiple different types of cancers, that, that those families have to be screened for Lynch syndrome. So, uh, what are the clinical implications of DNA damage repair gene mutations? Uh, it has been uh, shown that uh, those who have HRR gene mutations or uh, homologous uh, DNA repair uh, gene, uh, they are briefly called as HRR genes. So, it has been shown that those who have HRR gene mutations, they not only have an increased risk of prostate cancer, but the risk of that prostate cancer going into metastatic disease and going into hormone refractory disease is also higher. And therefore, these patients have a higher lethality due to prostate cancer. And there is a higher association with high Gleason score in these patients. They, there is also a higher incidence of intraductal variant of prostate cancer, which has a poorer prognosis. Now, whom to test? So, whom to test? There are guidelines that are available. And the guidelines that are most commonly used are the NCCN guidelines. Here, if you see the NCCN guidelines, uh, 
if there is a first degree relative of prostate cancer, if there is a first degree relative of breast cancer, if there is a first degree relative of colorectal cancer or endometrial cancer, if there is a male cancer in the family or exocrine cancer, then the 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 uh, the uh, the germline uh, genes should be checked, and therefore one can provide counselling to the whole family. And then again, Lynch-related cancers, then those patients, those families have to be screened for. And so far as the personal history is concerned, as per the NCCN guidelines, any patient who has a high-risk localized prostate cancer or has a metastatic cancer, whether it is hormone-sensitive or it is hormone-resistant, as per the NCCN guidelines, there should be a, uh, a somatic testing done for these to anticipate and guide the uh, treatment of metastatic disease in the future. If we look at the ASTRO, AUA, ASTRO, SEO guidelines, they are also similar. The basic bottom line is that those who have a high risk localized disease or metastatic cancer, whether hormone sensitive or hormone refractory, should ideally undergo a genetic testing. AUA SEO guideline 2020 says that clinicians should offer a PARP inhibitor to patients with deleterious, suspected deleterious germline or somatic homologous, again, HRR gene uh, mutations. After failure with enzalutamide or abiraterone or, and or a taxane-based chemotherapy. Now, <clears throat> PARP inhibitors are very expensive in our setup. In what we are doing at All India Institute is that for those patients who go into a status of CRPC after having exhausted abiraterone, enzalutamide, and docetaxel, then we do offer for those patients who can afford, <coughs> we do offer uh, a, a genetic testing the somatic genetic testing, and if they are positive for HRR gene mutations, then those who can afford, we are offering olaparib, oblique uh, rocaparib to these patients. But we are also offering carboplatin-based chemotherapy to those who cannot afford, those who are still reasonably fit and can afford uh, and can uh, withstand chemotherapy, carboplatin is not that expensive and we are offering carboplatin to these patients. In terms of strategies, these are well-known strategies which are described in all the books. There should be a pre-test counseling. The patient should understand what are the advantages and what are the limitations and what are the potential consequences of genetic testing because the whole families will have to be involved and so there is a uh, pre-test counseling. These are strategies which are important in USA, which are not important in our setup. These guidelines, because there they like to refer these patients to genetic counselors. Whereas in India, we don't have a large number of uh, genetic counselors and whatever genetic counseling has to be done, it has to be done by the treating physician. That is, it, it has to be done by us. So these guidelines of pre-test counseling, genetic testing, uh, so, uh, these are, I'll just go through these slides just for the sake of, uh, the idea is to explain the potential genetic test results, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, okay, now this is the list of germline tests that are available in, in the West. So, these are all uh, commercial uh, commercially available tests. In uh, So, there is a prostate next test. There is a color hereditary cancer test. So these tests, you know, they have different, uh, there are some tests which are specific for prostate. There are some tests which are for a tendency for a malignancy in the family. And the tests that are available in India, I have not listed them, but I have told you verbally that there are basically two kinds of panels that are available. One is the 15 gene panel and the other one is 200 gene panel and various labs are offering these at a cost of about 15,000 rupees per test. Whether the test is carried out in the blood or it is carried out in the tissue, the cost and uh, the platform 
they remain more or less the same. Again, for somatic tests, these are the tests that are available in the West. On uh, they they are uh, more expensive in the West, and one can send the samples in the West and uh, get them done, or they can get them done uh, here in India. And post-test counseling ideally should be done by genetic counselors, but practically we are the ones who are going to do the genetic counseling. Now these are a few more. Uh, uh, genes that are under study and which may become important in the future, but these are under study. So, in the final take home messages, that genome line genetic testing, although it is relatively new, but it is something which is getting established. And we should familiarize ourselves with the testing process and various types of genetic counseling. And somatic and germline testing strategies should be taken into consideration during treatment planning for metastatic prostate cancer. Thank you very much. If there are any questions, thank you. I would. Yeah. Yeah, I thank would, you, Nish. Uh, I think uh, uh, thank you very much. This has been a very clear expression, but we've got a very interesting episode now coming on. We've got uh, with us. We are honored actually to get uh, the presence of Dr. Mitwa Ghosh. She has been kind enough to join this panel for five minutes. She will give us a clarity. Dr. Mitwa Ghosh, are you there? Yes, sir. Hello. <clears throat> Good evening, all. Yes. Good evening, I, just, I just will. Uh, she's a geneticist and has been on our panel before. What we want from you is, what is your viewpoint as to what is going on with genetics testing in prostate cancer in India? And where are we lacking? What is the minimum that we should do? Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And it was a wonderful talk by uh, Dr. Amlish, uh, sir. Uh, it's, uh, it's really uh, amazing and delightful to hear from oncologists who are talking about genetic testing. It's a great honor for us, for the molecular biologists and geneticists. Uh, yes, genetic testing is taking... So I head the genetics department at HCG, Healthcare Global Enterprises. Uh, in Bangalore, and uh, basically molecular and genetic testing. And uh, genetic testing is kind of now becoming routine, as Sir said. We are doing both somatic and germline. In germline, I use about a 35 gene panel, and in somatic, I use uh, a 500 gene panel as well as a 55 gene panel. So 500 gene panel is the same, which is also uh, present in foundation one. But this test has been developed in India by our lab. So these are the panels. Now what we do is, and I completely agree with Sir said, I will add few things which is uh, in, we do in a little different way, which might add value. So doing a somatic and germline separately might not be possible. So what we do for our patients is we do a somatic testing from the tissue if the tissue is available. Now in the tissue, if we see BRCA1 or BRCA2, to mutations or any HRR gene mutations, what we see is the variant allelic frequency. So now if the variant allelic frequency is above 50%, right? If it is above 50%, we consider this to be as more of germline. And we tell the patient that your family members need to be tested because your BRCA, BRCA or BRCA2 has high variant allelic frequency. We test the family members as well as if needed, patient's germline also. Now, so sir has uh, very nicely covered everything. I did not say anything more, but I do a lot of somatic testing in prostate cancer. I have about 200 patients done on both small panel and big panel. And I want to draw your attention in Indian patient, one pathway, which is very common, about 50% of patients are having this pathway perturbed is AR uh, androgen receptor pathway. Androgen receptor is either there's a splice variant, AR splice, or a mutation, or a uh, amplification. And as you know, these are all bad uh, surrogate markers of hormonal therapy, either enzalutamide or arbiterone or any other hormonal therapy. So this, this is very common in our Indian patients, and we are trying to collect more data to establish the fact that it is very common in Indian patient. Uh, so this is very common we have seen, whereas we have tested many African patients because they come in our hospital. In African patient, the BRCA and HRR pathway is a very common uh, genetic mutation. 
So it's very, Indian patient is also there, but African patients are more BRCA carriers than Indian patients. So these are the things which we have seen. Uh, you talked about, sir, CFDNA, CTDNA. Yes, that's, you're very right. It is an important way to monitor the patient. The, another thing which I'm doing now is CTC, circulating tumor cells. So we use a FDA approved cell search platform to do CTC. And you know, in CTC cutoff above five is not a good prognostic factor in prostate. So we do a CTC not as one time, but we follow up the patients doing a CTC. So in conclusion, I combine testing, genetic testing, and monitoring of patients based on the mutations uh, present by CTDNA or by using CTC. And we use, we have BGCI, uh, you know, uh, accredited genetic counselors who do the pre-counseling and the post-counseling for the patients. Thank you. That was great to have an uh, Indian perspective. Uh, may I also inform you? You're mute. You have been muted, sir. You have been muted. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, we are uh, in the few in the in the forthcoming weeks. We are going to have a panel only on the genetic study in urology, and we are actually in, we have invited uh, uh, people from the Guy's Hospital and Royal Marsden. I would also invite you at that point of time, so that we get more clarity because this is a subject I feel the general urologist is very weak at. Let's admit it. Maybe so uh, can you... we ask one question to Dr. Amlesh and Dr. Mathua regarding this topic? Do we have time for that? Um, yes, uh, very quickly though. Huh? Yeah. So, sir, this is Puneet here, Amle, sir. And uh, Dr. Mithu, my question is that uh, in your presentation and as per guidelines, uh, uh, the genetic uh, somatic testing is indicated for any uh, patient with personal history of metastatic cancer. We do it upfront when the patient comes with a metastatic cancer diagnosis and we send the t uh, keep the tissue for uh, testing because in Western studies also, there are many centers uh, which were involved in the study, but the quality of DNA and the quantity of DNA goes down if we don't do it at that time. And but this is not used practically for treatment purpose at that time. Only when the patient becomes a CRPC, uh, at that time we use it for uh, treating it with olaparib or other drugs. Now, also from your presentation, and we also know that uh, with time the mutations changes and the load changes. So and the repeated testing may be required. So whether we decide uh, the treatment based on the repeated testing at the stage of CRPC, and then if that is so, then why do we need to do it uh, testing at that? time of uh, metastatic gastric surgery? Or do we okay. decide only on the basis yes. of uh, initial testing? Okay, Puneet, uh, your question is very relevant and you have asked a very precise question. I'll tell you practically what is happening is that we are not getting it tested at the stage of metastatic hormone sensitive. And so long as the patient remains hormone sensitive, we keep on treating with hormones only. Yeah. And the most patients will not even be able to afford the genetic testing or will, and even if genetic testing shows something, they will not be able to afford either Olaparib or uh, Rukaparib. So uh, there is not much point uh, getting it done. As I told you, what we are practically doing in our clinic is that those patients who have gone into hormone refractoriness. Actually, right now we are also carrying out a study. It's a uh, it's a uh, it's a part of a thesis of one of the students where the patients who have already gone into hormone refractoriness and have even failed docetaxel and then in them we are carrying out these studies to check the number one the uh, metast the um, genetic mutation load how much is the actual genetic mutation load and we are also going to treat these patients with carboplatin because in our setup carboplatin is something which can be afforded and these patients are are likely to respond to whatever limited data is available. They are likely to respond to carboplatin. So that is the uh, that is the practical situation right now. But you have rightly said that the Western guidelines are saying that all patients with metastatic disease should get it tested. But we cannot blindly follow the Western guidelines. It is practically not possible. It is uh, it is it doesn't make e economic sense at the present time. In the future, if the testing becomes cheaper and if treatment is available, then in that situation, definitely it will make economic sense at that time. 
So what Thank you, you in today's day? Yeah, I think we'll have to we'll have to carry on. We'll I think we've got a very significant panel discussion where I would request, though I did not warn, but if Dr. Mitwa Kush can also stay on, maybe we'll be of it will be of some help at some point of time. We really have a very vibrant panel discussion with a very senior moderator who has given us time. Uh, Professor N.P. Gupta is going to conduct a panel discussion on recent trends in the management of hormone-sensitive prostate cancer. With Punit, you are there. Sanjay Adla, are you there? Sanjay? Gautam, Gautam Ram Chaudhary and Manav Suryavansika. Sanjay Adla should be there, but um, we'll see. Over to you, Professor Gupta. Thank you, Dr. Avit Ghosh, for asking me to uh, conduct this panel discussion on management of hormones as to metastatic prostate cancer. As you all know, during the last decade, around now exactly uh, 10 or 11 years, there has been a significant change in management of the hormone sensitive prostate cancer. Androgen deprivation therapy was the standard of care, which we all have practiced for so many years. But it has been now changed that uh, androgen deprivation therapy is alone is not sufficient and a lot of new drugs have been added, so which has also created a big confusion in the mind of the treating doctors, what to choose, what not to choose. So in this uh, discussion today, we try to highlight how to select out a patient for which particular drug and uh, how best we can uh, treat a patient. I'll start with a case presentation, a 60-year male, presented with LUTs and low back pain for six months. He had diabetes and hypertension, well controlled on medical treatment. On uh, digital rectal examination, he has heart prostate. Trust guided prosthetic biopsy revealed Gleason 4 plus 4. His PSA was 46. His CVC, RFT and LFT were normal. PSMA PET CT was done, which revealed five bone metastases four axial and one non-axial, and there was no visceral metastasis. Patient was planned for androgen deprivation therapy alone. So this is a case I got from outside. So I'd like to, uh, Sanjay is available or not available? Sanjay is just joining, so we can put the first question to somebody else. Okay, so now I'll go, uh, go to Puneet again. Puneet? You think that androgen deprivation therapy alone is good enough in uh, today, or you think we must add something else to this? No, sir. There have been enough data now, uh, starting with chartered and uh, uh, stampede trials. Also, it, the combination therapy is the norm. At least we have to add some sort of uh, um, androgen re receptor uh, blockade also in, uh, to that. And along with that, uh, in the recent times, actually triplet therapy is also coming in. So ADT alone with this uh, high volume disease is not enough. You mean to say all patients or still there is a scope somewhere only androgen deprivation therapy? Even, even in uh, low volume disease, sir, uh, uh, ADT is uh, in the setting of metastatic, de novo metastatic acid sensitive prostate cancer. Even in low volume disease, uh, you should have a combination therapy now. Okay. Now, this is a slide shows the timeline. You know, ADT alone, as I have mentioned, 2013. Then 2015, first uh, androgen deprivation therapy and doxytexel was introduced. 2017, ADT plus Avitron plus Vitlisron was introduced. And then we have uh, this uh, uh, androgen deprivation therapy and radiotherapy to the primary. And then we have also ADT, NHT, like uh, apalutamide and angiotamide added in 2019. So you see, we have these uh, various combinations which are available for us. And this I am showing NCCN guidelines 2021. I am going to show you also the 2023 recommendations later on. Just to mention to you that they have mentioned that ADT with one of the following is preferred regime. Abiratron, apalutamide, 
doxytaxin, angiotamide. So these are the options, or we can give radiation therapy to the primary tumor for low volume with androgen deprivation therapy. So these are the five options which we have got, and this we are going to discuss in detail. So if you like to add any other therapy, how do you select which one? So that was the first question. Let us start with the doxytaxin, six cycles. And again, this I have marked for Puneet, but if Sanjay is available, he can also pitch in. Otherwise, Puneet, uh, when, what do you think is the, uh, when we should use uh, the doxytaxin according to the indication, contraindication? So, sir, uh, this is a high volume disease according to chartered criteria with the uh, five meds, uh, one uh, non axial med. So, in high volume disease, uh, actually, all of the drugs have been studied and have proven uh, to have uh, better overall survival. But this patient also had a diabetes and hypertension. So, abiraterone probably may not be. Uh, so, docetaxel actually uh, was uh, suitable for these sort of patients in combination with ADT till recently. But if I'm sure, like you said, that you'll be showing, uh, going, uh, you're going to show the uh, recent guidelines. So recent guidelines in EAU tell us that a uh, docetaxel alone as a combination with ADT is no longer a valid option if the patient is fit or if the availability of other um, uh, novel um, androgen receptor uh, blockage is there, like anzalutamide, apalutamide, or abiraterone. So in this patient, probably I would use docetaxel only as a combination with ADT along with uh, probably anzalutamide or apalutamide, not abiraterone, or uh, or maybe altogether avoid docetaxel and use ADT plus one of the last two. Okay. And uh, we can go to Mano. What is the role of abiraterone acetate plus prednisone? You like to mention, uh, tell us your indication, contraindication for use of this drug. Puneet has already uh, illustrated it in almost a single statement that uh, abiraterone should be avoided in diabetics and cardiac history and liver disease patients or hypertensives, you see. So this patient has got both the components of diabetes and hypertension. However, if the patient was not to have these factors, probably there has been a data in the past where you would choose an abiraterone first rather than enzalutamide because post abira enza gives a response, but post enza abira does not give a response. But the problem is the data is so evolving so fast that now they are talking in terms of triple therapy. So as of now, I have not seen a patient on triple therapy. I don't have a personal experience, but probably even that thing goes away. So practically in this patient, it's a triple therapy with a dosi and the last two if it has to be a triple therapy. So you want to go for triple therapy? I'm not saying it's triple therapy, but the way data is evolving, I have not had an experience seeing a patient on triple therapy. But the data presently is making a case for a triple therapy in a case, uh, patient with mm -hmm. high volume disease. What about the role of uh, angelotamide, Dr. Gautam? Hi, good evening, sir. So, as uh, I just one, ask one minute, Gautam, uh, I'm sorry I have not introduced the panelists, but you, I hope they are all very well known figures. Let me introduce the panelists first. Puneet, he has now joined Medanta as uh, director and head of uro oncology. Gautam Chaudhary is the professor of urology or uro oncology at the All India Institute of Medical Science. Uh, I'm just forgetting Jodhpur. the name. There's so many. Jodhpur. 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 Mano, he has joined the Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences as head of the urology. And Dr. Sanjay Adilika is from Apollo Hospital, Hyderabad. Anyone of you, those who are attending this, uh, if you like to make any comment, you are most welcome for that also. Yes, uh, Gautam, what about angiotamide? Yes, sir. First, so, in general, you can mention, then you can mention about this particular patient. Yes, sir. Generally, it is quite uh, clear that abiraterone is uh, at front line because choosing the addition of the second therapy to the ADT. Then AB is, you know, a little bit in the lower of the choice. So DOSI and the angelutamide are the option for him. And I would like to go with the angelutamide because angelutamide uh, is coming in a uh, uh, first, is, it is cheap nowadays and easy to administer and not a lot of side effects. It, it can be continued for till the disease start progressing. And in the docetaxel, only point is that it is very well tolerated in Indian patient and uh, it also had good response. But 
uh, sometimes we don't know that when to stop after six cycle or if the patient shows the response, then should we go for the ninth cycle? So, uh, angiolatamide, as we all know that uh, uh, started from the, uh, you know, CRPC to now came to the hormone sensitive prostate cancer. And the, there is a lot of evidence, angiolatamide trial, that it shows all group the whether the patient has received the docetaxel, not received the docetaxel, high volume disease, low volume disease, the patient re received the, you know, bone uh, 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 anti-resorption therapy and all these patients. So, ANJA showed response, very well response in all patients. So, I would like to add ANJA. As of now, I think the triple therapy is investigational and looking to Indian scenario and the maybe the heterogeneous disease here in the India. So, I would Stick with the two combination additive with angiolutamide or maybe dosing. Let us talk about the dose of angiolutamide. You think 160 milligram or you yes. can give 80 milligram? Only. Yes, sir, 160, but certain patient. And I had uh, one personal patient who had, you know, a neuropsychiatric symptom, not the seizures. Then I reduced the dose and he did well for six months. And now, after six months, on the 80 milligram per day, he started, he's showing the uh, rise in the uh, PSA. So he did good uh, even on the 80. But best is the 160 milligram if patient can tolerate. Yeah, Mano, I'd like to come back to you about this uh, doses of the Everdrod acetate. They initially started with 1000. Now we have a concept of 250 with meals. Would you like to make any comment and without print this row? So this again uh, boils down to the affordability of the patient. So, and uh, most of the times we have seen people reducing the doses and using them because they work for the patient financially also and uh, result-wise also. So, I think it still goes by an individual choice. No, I don't think so. It is only because of the individual choice. But initially they asked to take fasting. And now they say Ki, you give 250 to delay the absorption and uh, 250 is good enough. There are papers have also come out. But I know that there is not a big uh, study has been done for 250 milligram dose so far. Now, coming to the apelotamide, Dr. Sanjay has joined or not joined? Yes, Sanjay has joined. Okay. So, Sanjay? Yes, sir. Welcome. Hi, good Welcome. Evening. Sorry for the delay in me joining. So, no problem. I was just hearing the discussion for a somebody with a high volume metastatic prostate cancer. I would not agree with the idea that triple therapy is investigation. Triple therapy, I would say, is the standard of care. What would that be? It would be six cycles of docetaxel followed by a Beritron estate for at least two years. And that what would be my standard of care as of now, which is what we have been practicing, I would say, for a long time, just because patients who were already on docetaxel, rather than just keeping them on ADT, we were anyway giving them a Beritron estate. This one formalizes that and also gives quite a good advantage by the addition of aberatron acetate in addition to docetaxel. Coming to the specific question of apalutamide, I do not think apalutamide has got anything more to add compared to enzolutamide. It is almost the same molecule with the same side effect profile and the same penetration of bed brain barrier. So you would not have, darolutamide is different, but apalutamide is the same. And the evidence for enzolutamide is also as actually not as good as aberitron acetate or docetaxel because all the trials that have been done both with enzolutamide and apalutamide are drug company sponsored, whereas docetaxel and aberitron have been studied in independent of drug company sponsored one. The enzymat trial that we keep quoting wasn't powered to differentiate between low and high volume and we already had with docetaxel and without docetaxel in that one. So apolutamide would not be my option. My option would be a triple therapy with docetaxel and then aberitron See, Sanjay, Sanjay I, this I, let us come I, to this particular patient. He had a history of diabetes. Still, you think we should give aberitron acetate along with docetaxel? Yeah, so when, when, when I, I have got experience of using aberitron in England, so when I came to India, I thought I would struggle with giving this to diabetic patients and hypertensive patients. I would probably have about 100 patients on aberitron and only a couple of patients 
I have struggled with electrolytes and hypertension. I've almost never had a problem giving five milligrams of prednisolone or the full dose of abiraterone acetate at thousand milligrams. So my first go-to medication is always abiraterone acetate. If they cannot tolerate for any reason, then I would come down to enzalutamide for cost, as well as the when you look at the side effect profile, I find abiraterone acetate more tolerable compared to enzalutamide. Okay, uh, Puneet, uh, you think is there any role of radiotherapy to the primary, to the prostate, uh, or do you think this, it is not required? So for this patient, it's a high volume disease. And uh, we know that uh, radiotherapy as a treatment for the primary in a metastatic only is uh, uh, effective or, uh, or affects overall survival in low volume disease. So for this patient, uh, I would not get, uh, give radiotherapy. In low volume cases, you will like to give radiotherapy? Yes. In low volume, according to child, if less than uh, four bony mats or low volume uh, disease, if it fits into that criteria, I would uh, treat the patient's primary with radiotherapy. And I actually wanted to add one more point. Uh, I agree totally with Dr. Sanjay and I discussed with uh, medical oncologists also. The triple therapy is the norm now, but it is the norm only for high volume disease. The recurrent free survival and the overall survival for overall uh, is uh, uh, favorable in high volume disease. For low volume disease, the recurrent uh, progression free survival has been seen to be improved, but overall survival results are still not that. Yes, yes. Okay, okay so let us review the literature. Yes, sir. yes, sir. Please, please. we'll come back to you again. Yes, yes. So these are the properties of the different agents, doxytexin. It has to be given intravenous, 75 milligrams, and it has got the uh, can be uh, may be added here, but febrile neutropenia, neuropathy, these are the side effects. One of the advantage of doxytexin is that only six cycles are required. Abiratron and angulotamide, aplutamide, they are all oral. Evertron dose we have already discussed. Now, these are the side effects. Uh, the need of prednisolone, liver toxicity, and risk of hypertension. And then angiotamide, this is the, again, in seizures, I think so we have to be careful. There can be liver toxicity and risk of the hypertension. In aplotamide, we have risk of hypertension and also the some, there, some patients who have rashes. The problem with these three agents is that they have to be continued until progression. So this point I will discuss at the end again. But uh, so this I like to give the uh, the uh, properties. Now these are the three trials which have been uh, published for the doxytaxel, chartered get up AFU and Stempy trial. And here you see the survival duration. There is a 57 months in comparison to 44. They have 58 to 54 and 81 to 71. So there is a definite uh, improvement in the survival. Therefore, the doxytaxel is recommended as mentioned in the high volume disease that I will also discuss later on. And then for the hormonal agents, we have got these four drives, latitude, stampede, enjamat, and titan. And... Uh, here again, if we see that uh, in this angiotamide group, they say survival benefit is uh, 83 percent versus 76, and at overall survival at three years again in angiotamide 80 to 72 percent, and in Titan it is 68 versus 47. So all these agents are showing survival uh, benefit. This is the two trials of the radiotherapy in metastatic cancer prostate, Howard and Stampede. And here the survival only difference is of two months, 45 versus 43, 65% versus 62. So there is not much improvement in the overall survival in patients with whom we are using radiotherapy to the primary. However, the further prospective trials are going on in this area. Can I, I like to discuss a couple about of points, this. just one minute, the... comment later on. One more uh, paper I want to quote here, this is recently uh, published in European Urology, in which they have done indirect comparison of efficacy between combination approaches in metastatic prostate cancers. There are seven trials uh, on 8,837 patients, and he, they have compared the in relation to ADT and angiotamide. 
So all four interventions demonstrated significant improvement in overall survival. ADT alone is no longer a successful therapy for metastatic uh, hormone sensitive to prostate cancer, which agent to add depends upon various factors. And angiotamide and ADT has been found to have the better in comparison to the others. So this is shown here that in compared to ADT, angiotamide has the best of uh, results. And compared with angiotamide, you see the hazard ratio here. And uh, aplotamide has not big response, whereas others have shown less response. In, and now coming to this high volume and low volume, in comparison to the ADT in low volume disease, again, doxytaxel has got no benefit. Whereas in uh, high volume disease, the doxytaxel has got a good effect. Angiotamide has also shown good effect. And in compared to angiotamide, Again, the aplotamide has not shown better uh, result, but doxytaxel and others have shown good result. So now, for making a decision, the important things are fitness for chemotherapy. I think so patient has to be fit to undergo the chemotherapy. Fitness for ARI frailty, comorbidities, neurological disorders. Fitness for Evitron for blood sugar, cardiac history, liver disease. And as we have discussed in the genetic non-AR phenotypes, poor PSD expression and presence of hepatic metastasis, I think so we have to consider all these factors when we decide the treatment. For low volume disease, chemotherapy is less appropriate. Evidence of ARI and Abiratron, less compelling data for doxytaxel. And high volume disease, chemotherapy appropriate, doxytaxel, ARI and Abiratron. So, when we decide for a particular therapy, I think so all these factors have to be combined. And in, in relation to the India, I should also like to add the cost of the treatment. That I'm not discussing here, but at the end, if time permits, we can discuss a little bit on that. So now this triple therapy we have already discussed. So Gautam, while you, what yes. you like to make comment now? Yes, sir, two comments regarding the triple therapy because triple therapy has not shown the overall survival. And second is that when we use the two drugs, we have chance to re-challenge or use the sequential, uh, you know, remaining option for the treatment and then the sequential use of the what we used earlier. So till I get the data of the overall survival, I would say that it's a, you know, still not the final one that we should use upfront triple therapy, especially in Indian patient because our population may be heterogeneous from the Western population. We don't have over data. So we should be slow in, uh, you know, utilizing their data in treating so aggressively because these patients usually do good on a combination therapy, ADT with the one of the drug. So that was my point. So though the PEACE trial says that triple therapy is showing a very good result and the uh, progression-free survival is better than what we use the combination therapy. So I do agree with that. But, uh, you know, still, till I have data of the overall survival, I would like to have you know, uh, would like to go slow. Sanjay, you like to make any comment now? I think what we have shown right from the initial Stampy trial was the sequential doesn't work in that if you are trying to keep docetaxel in your pocket or abiraterone in your pocket and say, I will use it when the patient progresses. In Stampy or any of the trials, the standard of care is the sequential one compared to giving all of them at the outset. So I would always like to go with the triple therapy in high volume disease, and it is very well tolerated. Just going back to the previous one, wherein we said abiraterone or enzalutamide need to be continued long term. Actually, in the stampede <clears throat> or any of the trials, they were meant to be only given for two years. The median usage was only for 22 months. It wasn't until the patient progressed. We tend to use it because we like to keep it under control because patient has responded. But the trial evidence is for only two years. It is the same even in patients who have got high-risk prostate cancer wherein we are using abiraterone. It is only for two years. So I would always go for all of the medications that are allowed at the outset rather than giving them in a sequential setting. 
Okay, Sanjay. I, I, uh, I would uh, add one more point. Yeah, Puneet. In peace uh, trial, if you see, it started in 2013. And uh, if, when it started, the standard of care was, as Sir showed in the previous slide, was ADT alone. Their standard of care in the control arm kept on changing in the peace trial. So it was ADT alone. Then it, uh, came, uh, it, it became as a combination. So they evaluated the triplet therapy against combination also. And it was seen that in high volume, both uh, progression-free and overall survival results were better in low volume overall survival data is not mature enough but in high volume it is there so i i think it is time now to, to think of triplet therapy in uh, patients with high volume upfront metastatic disease so this is the peace trial what you have uh, mentioned uh, that adt alone this uh, this this is the result survival 33 months 34 35 adt plus doxytexel 40 42 44 48 ADT and Avertron 50 and 56. And this is the peace trial ADT, Doxytexel, and Avertron 61 months. So definitely uh, this has got a better outcome and uh, high volume disease. But question comes to the practical utility in our practice, are we using that or not? And uh, this is the uh, 23, uh, uh, NCCN guidelines just released recently in which they have mentioned that ADT with one of the following, Avertron, Aflutamide or Angelotamide or ADT with Doxytexin and one of the following, Avertron and Darolutamide. As Sanjay have already, already mentioned that uh, Aflutamide may not be of much useful but Darolutamide can be combined in the, this uh, particular setting. So the triple therapy, again I want to ask uh, how many, uh, Sanjay has already said that he's using it and he has also mentioned that are you using for two years only Sanjay or do you stop sometimes this triple therapy? So when I'm... Or dual therapy the, also, you know. Okay, in my dual therapy, I continue with the aberatron acetate lifelong until they progress. Whereas in triple therapy, I'm stopping it at two years. But none of my patients have yet reached the two-year term because the the triple therapy evidence is only recent. Sir, may okay. I ask may I ask a quick quick question, sir? Yes, yeah. yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, so, in all this uh, protocols, what you're using, uh, do you use it's just for my academic understanding? Do you use any monitoring method? Because we are using different therapies, we are monitoring the overall survival and PFS. So, do you use any uh, in addition to PSA, which is not very stringent uh, marker? Do you use CFDNA or CTC circulating tumor cells to monitor your patients? The correct answer is no, I, as far as we are concerned. But, uh, but uh, I'm sure uh, apart from the PSA, nowadays we are doing PSMA PET CT also to see the regression of the metastatic disease and all that. So the response is calculated like that actually. Okay. Actually, when we look at any of the non-metastatic CRPC setting, all the Gleason, the clinical staging, the volume of the disease, all of them seem to go out of the window and the PSA doubling time of less or more than 10 months seems to make a difference. So though PSA is a crude marker, currently that is the only marker that is available. Okay, okay I, like to, uh, I like to just one minute. I like to... Uh, Whenever we see all these figures, I think so we should read the bottom also. And here it is very clearly mentioned that NCCN believes that the best management of any patient with cancer is in a clinical trial. And uh, participation in clinical trials is especially encouraged. So my request is all of you who are using triple therapy and all that, are you using in clinical trial setting where you are doing really evaluation of these therapies or you are just uh, using in your clinical practice straightforward so, answer uh, there isn't uh, any yeah my point uh, so my, uh, sir what was the like in NGMAT trial uh, progression free survival was uh, how much was the progression free survival in the combination it was reaching up to the what is reaching in the peace trial even for the yeah. high uh, high volume no, no, disease the, the issue with the NGMAT trial was it wasn't planned to be uh, having the docetax alarm so halfway, they had to almost have the same number of patients, but half of them had docetaxel, half of them did not have docetaxel. That's the first thing. Then the uh -huh. second one is 
when they looked at actually whenever you added docetaxel with enzalutamide if you look at the curves actually Toxicity. it seems to be inferior even compared to either docetaxel or enzalutamide and the only rational reason is that it was just so underpowered for any of those subgroup analysis that we can't take anything out of the enzyme trial overall overall survival was as good as of the p trial in the triplet therapy so my point is here that though we could not in the enzyme trial they could not analyze subgroup because uh, you mentioned that lot of you know things were there but still if we see the overall survival in the all subgroup at uh, burden of the disease use of the docetaxel and the comorbidity index everything so i yeah. think as of now triplet therapy in the practice i want to be slow this is my just submission no no okay. i understand we'll but we'll change uh, gears we like to have one or two more uh, uh, points to discuss how many of you have started doing all this genetic testing dr manov you like to make any comments we were already doing it in medanta i have shifted to amrita so over here we are putting a system in place we'll have a state of the art lab uh, but if you ask me for the indications then a testing should be offered to a prostate cancer patient with a metastatic disease a ductal or an intrarectal histology and a positive familial history in fact we can even consider offering a patient who's going to be on active surveillance a genetic testing but then he should have a clear understanding of the implications in case it turns out to the to be positive it will have a cascading effect for his familial counseling and other uh, subsequent uh, domino testings in the family moreover uh, uh, possibly the question that you say about braca positivity so i do not have a personal data but i can quote you from the literature that possibly around uh, 12% odd patients would have a germline uh, testing mutation positive while around 24 25% of the patients will have of crpc will show a dna repair pathway aberration on somatic testing sanjay dr amlesh said has already given the guidelines but still you like to mention something are you doing any of these I, genetic uh, testing probably i am a bit more aggressive i tend to do it in all patients who are a bit atypical young patient who has got an aggressive disease i am doing it almost all metastatic patients i am doing it with the information that it doesn't change what i am doing at the outset it is mainly helpful in prognosticating the disease and being more aggressive at the outset so that's the reason i'm ten, i'm doing it so that i've got a fresh tissue specimen that i can send at the outset for this analysis and it will be there on record if i need to use it but at least in hyderabad we have reached a stage where in patients who come to me saying that i am already a braca2 positive and this is my psa where do we go further so these are people who have been screened for the family and they have been turned to be positive for braca2 and then we are trying to work out when what is the trigger for doing the biopsy in psa i.e is the psa lower or higher in these age group patients okay we'll so these are the guideline recommendations i think so amlesh has very nicely mentioned so i will not repeat only thing is that uh, uh, this uh, testing helps you in your treatment sanjay you mentioned it doesn't going to make any difference in your treatment it does make a difference in that uh, let's say that we, there is some anecdotal there is no proper evidence in that surgery is preferable compared to radiotherapy that's one second uh, psa in these patients seems to be a bit lower that's the second one and then the third one is that these patients overall the prognosis is is bad compared to somebody who is braca negative so that's those are the three things that i take away in case of a patient is positive pudit you like to make any comment sir, Will you, you are also already, doing uh, this testing so do you yes, change sir. your management plan sir in this particular scenario what we are discussing castrate sensitive at present no Uh, we continue with the uh, combination treatment or a triplet therapy whatever we decide and then uh, it is basically prognostic and then uh, for the future uh, when the patient goes to crpc then uh, based on the trials evidence uh, profound trial and triton we have the evidence that uh, that may result in improved survival and may lead to actually use of olaparib or, or other pap inhibitors like tocopurib so at that point of stage we might change the treatment but uh, at this particular stage no so these are the some of the new recommendations as per the fda on the basis of the profound study in 2020 they have uh, 
suggested uh, the use of the Ola Parib, and uh, these are the response. And in May 2020, uh, based on the Triton therapy, they have used use of Luka Parib. So I think so these things, uh, I don't know any one of you are using PARP inhibitors or something like that. We Madam, have you have probably... A couple of patients, Ola Parib, but again, it is not me who initiated it. It was in combination with the medical oncologist. Certainly, we have to take help of the medical oncologist. Yeah. Okay, I think so. We have had discussion. And final, the key points are the treatment of metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer is a complex topic. Careful evaluation of the volume of the disease, bony versus visceral, comorbidities, and performance status have to be determined before we start the treatment. The treatment choice should be individualized. Patient preferences, because some patients may not like to go for chemotherapy. You ask them, but they say, no, we don't want. Sometimes the cost comes in between and volume of the disease and side effect profile are equally important in deciding the best treatment for an individual patient. I think so the treatment has to be individualized instead of making the in general, treating everybody with the same kind of treatment. If anyone can else I, like to ask any questions can I just, or make can any I just comments. Clarify, can I just clarify one point, sir? The, both yes. the survival curves that you showed for the radiotherapy for prostate cancer, in metastatic prostate cancer, that is from the radicals trial, you showed the survival curves for the overall stampede, uh, overall cohort, the stampede cohort, sorry overall cohort, only when they did it, subgroup analysis of low and high volume, they found a difference in the low volume. Even overall survival difference is there for the low volume compared to the high volume. So I don't want the uh, viewers to think that the low volume don't have a survival benefit. They do. The survival curve that you showed was for all patients, not the... Yeah, yeah I volume. agree with you. In low volume, it has got a role, radiotherapy, yes. you know. And we have, yeah. personally, if you ask me, I have got some patients who have been treated by radiotherapy and when they have got the bone metastasis in the pelvic bones only, in symphysis, pubis, and they are all have done very well, actually. You know, like that. Any other Thank questions you, or Gupta. comments? Yeah. I think yeah. I think we can we can stop now because I yeah, think really we've important. got some important announcement from Ravi Mohan for the future. Yeah. Uh, Ravi, can you please Thank take you, over? Ravi. Please take over. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Gupta, sir, for a fantastic uh, panel discussion, I would say, moving from double to triple therapy. And I think we are there as of now for triple therapy, only that we to choose it wisely. And we are underutilizing our uh, genetic testing, which is very evident uh, that eventually we'll have data on our genetic testing and when should we do and when should we not do. But yes, it should be done whenever feasible, because as Sanjay said, if not anything, it's telling us to prognosticate patient better and also to generate some database for our own patient as made so madam emphasized. Now, having said that, uh, I have some, I have a duty to announce uh, certain things. So I'll just share my slides. Now, as uh, Dr. Ghosh reiterated right at the beginning, an appeal and uh, Gupta sir agreed to it that we uh, earnestly request everyone to make uh, that your oncology meeting can be successful only and only when we all are a part of it. So I request everyone to propagate this message and also ensure that we, uh, we join this meeting. And it would have interesting uh, uh, operative workshops. In fact, we have uh, revamped the program to much more live operative workshops apart from already, uh, already promised uh, resident corner and, and other things. Now, this was the fourth webinar. Thank you, Gupta sir, for conducting this and the Amlesh sir and all the panelists. Uh, next, we would have on 17th of April, that is next Monday, from 7.30 to 8.30, uh, we would have a journal club, and this would be conducted by uh, Professor Raju Kumar, and everyone knows him, his uh, academic uh, skills, and we would have four young urologists as a, as a panel, Ashwin Tamankar, Aditya Sharman, uh, Ashwin is from Mumbai, Aditya is from PJ Chandigarh, Vikas is from AIMS Rishikesh, and Dr. Sukhdev Singh is from CNC Bellow. Subsequent to that, on 24th of April, we will have another webinar, and the topic this time would be muscle and bladder cancer. Again, as Ghosh said, we will be focusing more on uh, genomic aspects uh, in, in this also, 
and this will be moderated by Santosh Kumar, Dr. Santosh Kumar from CMC Bellore and Dr. Ganesh Bakshi from Mumbai. Uh, thank you all and have a pleasant night. Thank you for joining the meeting. I repeat, I repeat, before you before you retire, I re repeat, at least there were 77 viewers today. If you can all please take your, put your right foot forward and register, it will be a moral booster for us who are working behind the scenes to make this first annual conference a success. Puneet, Manav, Professor Gupta has already committed uh, 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 and, and all the rest of us. And a special thank you to Mitwa Ghosh. I think we should, we are not ignoring you, Dr. Ghosh. We are really honored with your presence. We need more of your presence because our theme this time is genomics. Thank you very thank much. You. Good night. Thank Before you. we thank close, you. I want to just uh, mention that there are some questions have been asked, uh, though Sir. we uh, could not take up those questions. But one is that lutetium therapy. I think so. This is also coming up in a big way. And that was not included in today's program because it is not in the guideline at the moment. But certainly the data is maturing now. And lutetium-based therapy is also one of the alternative in management of the metastatic prostate cancer. The others are usual, but uh, we have already covered most of them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you Thank and you. good night. Good night sir. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.